Hey everybody, Johnny here. In this video, we're going to take a look at an update of an old video I did, creating these block sound diffusers. The previous video was using Blender before 3.0 came out. That's before fields came to geometry nodes. This time around, we're going to use fields and we're going to use completely procedurally generated geometry. So let's get into it. We're going to tackle this problem in two phases, one for the blocks and one for the border. In the previous video, we used existing objects for the blocks and then added the border manually when we were done. This time we want to do the entire object procedurally. So let's start with the blocks. First, we'll get rid of our default camera and light, jump over to the geometry nodes tab and add a new tree. Let's go ahead and add a couple of the settings we know we're going to want to be able to set from the get-go. So in our end panel, we'll go to the group tab and then add an integer input. This one will be the number of blocks. Now for this project, we're just going to do square diffusers, meaning the number of blocks across the bottom and across the sides are going to be the same. That's just to keep the level of complexity of this video down. Next, we want to be able to determine the size of the blocks. So this time, we'll add a float input and call it block size. All right, let's start with that. It makes a lot of sense for our blocks to be made out of cubes. So we'll go ahead and add a mesh primitive cube. Since our blocks will start off as cubes, we can just plug the block size into the cube size. Here, we'll just put a value of one. The next thing we want to do is instance this in a grid. To do that, we'll need a grid object. So we'll go to Mesh Primitive Grid. Now the vertices X and Y for our grid are going to be the number of blocks. So we can just plug this into both. Then we can add an Instance on Points node, where our mesh will be our points and our instance will be our cube. Now we don't see anything here, but that's just because our blocks are currently set at zero. As I increase our blocks, we notice that we get something here, but it's not quite right. The reason this is wrong is because we haven't set the size of the grid. It's staying the same as we increase the number of blocks. So at first, our thought might be that our size will be the number of blocks times the block size. So let's give that a try. We'll use a utility math node and multiply the number of blocks times the block size. This gives us the blocks, but now they're all spread out, and we want them to be touching each other. We can think of our instance cubes like this. So currently, our height is set to the width of the square times the number of points. And since there are five points, and the width of the square is one, we get a grid that's five points wide. But since the centers of the cubes are placed on the points, they're gonna be spread out further than there is space. Because while from here to here is five units, we have half the width of the cube sticking out beyond either side. To change this, we simply need to subtract one from the number of cubes and multiply that by the size of the cube. That will tighten things up. Back here, we'll simply subtract one from this multiplied value. And now we see that our cubes are packed in nicely. The next thing we want to do is alter the heights of our cubes. Since we can't alter the individual cubes before we instance them, we need to alter the instances themselves. And we're going to do that by scaling them on the z-axis. So we'll go ahead and add an instances scale instances node. And if we change the z-height, our cubes get stretched out. But if we look at it from the side, we see that it's scaling out from the center. They're not just getting taller, they're also going in the other direction. To alter this, we want to move the cube so that they start out with their bottom aligned with the center of the object. I'll mute this scale instances node for now, so we're just looking at our original cubes again. We want to move these up on the z-axis by half their width. So here, after my cube object, I'll add a set position node. I'll pull out the offset and add a combine vector node. Adjusting the Z here will allow us to reposition the cubes. We'll use the block size to drive this, but we only want half of the size, not the full size. So we'll simply divide by two. 
Now our cubes are sitting on top of the origin. Unmuting my scale instances node, we'll see this in action. Next, we'll want to add varying heights to our cubes. Add a random value node and a combine XYZ node. We'll hook this into the scale and hook our value into the Z. At this point, our cubes have disappeared but that's because our combine XYZ is set to 0, 0 for the X and Y scale. We want to change these back to 1. When these types of diffusers are built in the real world, the blocks are cut to specific lengths. In this instance, the blocks can go from anywhere from 0 to 1 in height, where in actuality we would want this to be stepped. To do that, I'll just change this to an integer. We'll bring the integer down to a more reasonable level, like say 5, and we can of course scale this down more by adding a multiply node. Here, the value of this cube was zero, so now we get this black spot. I'm gonna change that by changing my minimum height to one. So now each block will be at least one high and a maximum of five. So that gets us our blocks. Now we want a frame. There are multiple ways we can do this, but I wanted a frame with 45 degree angle cuts on either side. There's a bunch of different ways we can handle this. And so this is just one way. I'm sure you can come up with a bunch of other ways to make a cool frame. I'm gonna drop the size down to six, just to get rid of some of the visual noise and to line the cubes up with the grid nicely. Now for our border, we're gonna wanna be able to determine the height of the border as well as the width of the board. So let's go ahead and add those as inputs. So to create the border, I'm going to use a curve quadrilateral and then duplicate it on each side. I'll add the curve quadrilateral node and then join it to my scale instances. I'm going to change the type to trapezoid. For a moment, I'll connect this only to the output. What we want is to create a shape that has a 45 degree angle here, a length here, another 45 degree angle, and then back out this way. If we look at our controls, we see that the height adjusts it in this direction. So that'll be what we consider our border width. For clarity, I'm gonna duplicate my group input and bring it down over here. That way I don't have a lot of lines stretching the entire length of my node tree. So I'll plug my border width into the trapezoid height. Next, we wanna make sure that this middle section of our trapezoid is placed evenly in the center. To do that, we'll just change the offset from one to zero. There, I've moved the trapezoid over so we can see what's going on. This edge of the trapezoid we'll want to place on the outer edge of our cubes. So we'd like this to be lined up with our center point. Like we did before with the height of the cube, we'll do this now with this direction on the trapezoid. We'll use a set position node, do a combine XYZ on the vector, and then move it down on the y-axis, half the height of the trapezoid. Since we see that the border width made this go up, we actually need the negative then. If we want to make this go half of the negative direction, we could just simply multiply this by negative 0.5. The next thing we need is for the width to work. Let's go ahead and bring our cubes back in. Currently, our trapezoid is sitting here in the middle of our grid we want it to be on the outside. Since currently this is at zero and we want it to be here, we can see we need to move this down one, two, three units. So it needs to be moved down half of the number of blocks times the block size. We can simply add that value to the amount we're already moving it down for the trapezoid. So if we take the number of blocks and divide it by two, multiply that by the block size, and then subtract that as well, now our trapezoid has moved into the right place. At this point, we just need to work out the width of our trapezoid. The top width controls this side of the trapezoid, and the bottom width controls this side. We want the top side to simply be the number of blocks times the block size. But then the question is, how much do we need to add to the bottom to make this work? We might remember something about a 45-45-90 triangle. And that is 
that the length and the height are the same. So we simply need to add the height of our trapezoid to this bottom length for each side. So if we take this value, which is coming in as the border width, and multiply it by two, one for each side, and then we add that to the top width, you'll see we get a nice 45 degree angle here. There's two things left to do with the border. One thing is placing this trapezoid on each side, and then the other thing is extruding this trapezoid upwards to form the thickness of the border. Let's do the rotation first. This whole section here is our bottom trapezoid. I'm gonna control J on this and join them together just so it's cordoned off. And we know that this output generates this trapezoid. We wanna duplicate this trapezoid so that we have four of them. We'll use the geometry duplicate elements node to do this. Since our trapezoid is a curve, we'll use the spline type and we'll say we want four of them. Now we need to rotate this around the object. We'll bring in a set position node and now we need to determine how we set these positions. We want to take each of the points of our spline and rotate it around this center point. And we want to do it a different amount for each spline. So to rotate a point, we can remember that a point is actually designated by a vector. So if we use the vector rotate node, we can take a point, give it a center point, and then rotate it a certain amount. The type of rotation I want to do is an Euler rotation. The vector that I want to rotate is the position. So I'll use the input position node and plug it into vector. That gives me these points of the trapezoid. The rotation center is here at the center of the object, so that can stay at 0, 0, 0. And the rotation we want to do can be determined by this vector. We'll go ahead and plug our output vector into the new position. If we change the Z rotation, we see that this moves around. We'll use the duplicate index of the duplicate elements node to determine how much to rotate each set of points. I'll go ahead and add a combined vector node here because we only want to affect the Z. If I plug the duplicate index into the Z coordinate for the rotation, you'll see that I get this. Remember, this is because this is rotating the first one, zero, the next one, one, the next one, two, and the next one, three. These rotations are in radians. So we want to multiply the duplicate index by the amount we want each one to rotate which is 90 degrees. If you know your radian math, then you can use a utilities math node, set it to multiply, and then multiply it by pi over two. But you may not know how that works. So another way you can accomplish this is instead of putting pi over two as your multiply value, make another math node and do the conversion to radians. Plug that in, and set the degrees to 90. This will accomplish the same thing, and it might make more sense to you that we're rotating this 90 degrees on the z-axis. The last thing we want to do with our frame is to give it some height. That can be simply done with a curve to mesh node. Our trapezoids are going to be our curve profile, and our curve will be a curve line. We'll want the fill caps option on, and then we'll want to set the Z height. And since we're in points mode with start and end, it's already starting at 0, 0, 0, and then only going in one direction. So let's go ahead and add a combined vector node here. I'm gonna add my group input again and plug in the border height to the Z. Now for a little cleanup on the output. I'm gonna add a mesh set shade smooth node and turn that off. Now all of my objects here are going to be shaded solid. If we look over here in our spreadsheet, we see that we have mesh data, which is our border, and then we have instances, which are our cubes. I'm gonna go ahead and add an instance realize instances node, and that's gonna turn all of our instances into mesh data. This is important 
because since we don't have a bevel node yet, we're going to want to add a bevel modifier after the fact. So I can simply do that here in my modifier stack. But this will only work on mesh data. If I were to have done this before, it would have ignored all of my instances. We're also going to want a material here. So we'll use a set material node. And we can go ahead and drag this to the input as well. I'll go ahead and choose the basic material here. Here in my shader tab, we can apply a quick texture. With the Node Wrangler plugin enabled, I'm going to select the principled BSDF and press Control Shift T. I'm going to use a texture that I got from AmbientCG.com, which is just this simple wood texture. Since Blender 3.2.0 doesn't have great support for geometry node UV coordinates yet, we're going to use the generated coordinates instead of UV. And we'll want to make a few adjustments just to randomize this, because if we look at this, it doesn't look great right now. I'm going to use the fact that each one of these objects is a separate mesh island. So I can use my input geometry node and use my random per island to drive some settings. I can use it to drive the location of the vector I'm using to place my textures. I could also use it to drive the rotation. Here we're already starting to look a little better. Of course, these are just quick tweaks, and I'm sure you can come up with something much better. The one last thing I want to do is give each block a different tone of shade. So I'll duplicate my geometry node, add a hue saturation node to the color channel of my texture, and then use the random per island to drive the value. When you do that, one thing you'll notice is that the islands have been calculated oddly. I'm not sure exactly why it does that, but if we go back to our geometry node setup, instead of realizing the instances here when we're getting both instance and mesh data, if we only realize the instances before joining them with the other mesh data, it looks a whole lot nicer. So there you go. The block diffuser tutorial updated for Blender 3.2 and Fields. I hope you got something out of this tutorial, and I hope it inspires you to make something awesome. So until next time, I'll catch you later.